a series of cells that are organized by row and by column. All right. So for example, if we were going to do an average temperature chart in different cities around the world, we might have a row for Cleveland, a row for Los Angeles, a row for, um, what would be a real cool, cold city, Minneapolis. Then we might have columns for January, February, March. And then we'd have the different numbers in there. So let's say the average temperature in January for Cleveland is 10 degrees, 20 degrees, and 30 degrees. In Los Angeles, maybe it's 60, 70, and 80. Probably not accurate, but we'll go with it. And Minneapolis, it might be 5, 15, and 20. All right, so we have a series of rows and columns. There's a row of headings. There's a row of data, a row of data, a row of data. Then there is three columns worth of data. That's what I mean by a table. All right. So we can identify what a particular piece of data means by looking at what row and what column it's in. So for example, this 20. What does that 20 represent? That 20 represents the March temperature for Minneapolis. All right. Pretty simple and straightforward. All right. A couple things to keep in mind. Um, we can do that easily because we can see. All right. And that, that might sound obvious, but when we talk about developing web pages, one of our concerns is developing web pages that are accessible for people that cannot see. All right. So we can tell what value any given cell is simply by visually looking up and, uh, up and across, up for the column title and across for the row title. Someone that can't see can't do that easily. So we're going to have to build some accommodations into our table to make it easy for people to uh, have their assistive technology help them out with that kind of thing. All right. So we'll, we'll sort of keep that uh, in the back of our mind. All right. Now, that's what we're going to use tables for. Um, tables can be more complicated. Um, for example, you could have inside a table, you could have another table if you wanted to. Really, we could have a row for high temperature and a row for low temperature all built within this cell. And we can make the table really complicated. Generally speaking, from a coding perspective and from an accessibility perspective, it's best to keep your tables very simple. All right. Um, let me tell you what tables are not used for. It used to be in the old days before CSS was widespread use and widespread supported in browsers that tables were used to achieve the layout on a web page. So for example, you would create a table. You know, normally when you think of a table, you think of rows and columns. Developers back then would develop tables that were the entire page and that the columns and rows were very large. So they might develop a two by two table that looked like that. And they might put the logo in this cell of the table. They might put the banner in this cell of the table. They might put their navigation in this cell. And they might put their content in this cell. So they used the table tags to sort of create a layout. That was done out of necessity. That was done because CSS either wasn't around or it was around and it wasn't adequately supported between browsers. So developers took this sort of shortcut. All right? And it was OK to do that then, but now we have better tools for it. Now we have CSS that works across browsers. So it's better off not to do this. And what is bad about this approach, for those of you that may have tried it or may think, hey, that sounds like a good idea, is that it's very limiting. In other words, you cannot have a table layout that adjusts itself to become one column 
if the browser window is very narrow. All right? You can do that with uh, a floating layout. All right? um, so uh, because of that, um, using tables for layout uh, is not a good idea. So I mention it only if you see an example, maybe somewhere online, or um, if, uh, again, on, on the chance that maybe you've done some web development um, some time ago and you use tables then. All right, so we're not going to use tables now. There is a new thing that we don't cover in this class that you could look at uh, if you want, a new addition to CSS3 that's partly supported, and that is the CSS grid layout, which you can use as well. Um, we're, not, we're probably not going to cover that uh, at all, but that's another uh, option. Um, that you can use. Um, but at any rate, we're going to talk about using tables in this manner where we actually have data tables. So let's go and let's duplicate this. And I'm going to do it wrong first, just to illustrate a point. All right? So if I'm typing this in and you say, hey, that's not going to work, good for you. All right? Because it's not going to work. But I'm doing it to sort of illustrate the point. So let's imagine that we have a web page, so let me go into Notepad++ and create my web page. All right, so there's our basic shell of a page. Let's go, let's try to copy the data right from Excel, see if it will let me do it. Good. Now, it should be pretty easy to see why this is not going to work. All right, you might think, well, there's our table. All right. Why is that not going to work? Go ahead. Browser doesn't know it's a table. And again, how, does, how do browsers interpret white space? Browsers interpret white space as just being uh, a single space. So the fact that I have tabs here to tab out to make it in the nice columns, and the fact that I have a carriage return here to push that over and all that, that means nothing to the browser. It's just going to interpret each of those as a single space. So what am I going to get? I'm going to get all the data in one line. So let's go and save this to prove the point, and then we'll move on to doing it correctly. All right, so if we view this in the browser,
as predicted, absolutely nothing happens. Oh, here we go. It's just one line of data, again, because that's how the browser interprets that. So what do we do to tell it that it's a table? Well, what do we do to tell the browser that any piece of text is something? What do we do to say that this is an image? What do we do to say that this is a paragraph or a link or whatever? We use the tags to do that. So there are tags to designate uh, sections of the table and pieces of the table. Um, there's four main tags that we'll go over, and then there's a few sort of extra tags that go in. The first, let me, let me define the tags that we're going to use and talk about them, and then we'll, we'll see them in action. And I'm going to do this instead, instead of writing on that. There is a table tag. There's a TR tag. TH and TD. All right? The table tag goes around the table. Says where the table starts, says where the table ends. All right? Pretty self-explanatory. The TR tag, TR stands for table row. You can think of a table as being made up of a series of rows. So, in this particular table, we should be having one, two, three, four rows. All right. So a table is a set of rows. Each row is comprised of a variety of, of cells. All right. Um, just like in Excel, you have the cells. Right. You have um, places where you can put headings in, places where you can put numbers or formulas or whatever. There's two kinds of cells. There's THs and TDs. THs stand for table headings. TD stands for table data. So in this row, or in this uh, table, these would be headings. In fact, I'm going to go in and throw in another heading for city, just to make it uniform. But we have city, January, February, March, and this is the data. So Cleveland is the city. January is um, the first column. The second column is February. The third column is March. Or actually. Second, third, and fourth, right. So in this table, we're going to have four rows, and each row is going to have four cells. One, two, three, four. So let's go and let's put these uh, tags in. Table. Ending table. Yay. TR. First table row is going to go around the whole first row. And then these are all going to be TH. Each of these is going to be its own row.
I'll go and make the NTDs in a minute here. I understand how it's not enjoyable watching me type for this amount of time, and I'm trying to do this as quickly as possible. That's why I like the cooking shows, because like they tell you how to make a, a turkey or something, and they put it in, then like two minutes later after the commercial, they come back and they pull a finished one out. So if we had commercials in this, I could have an already completed web page that I just pulled out after we went to commercial, but oh well. I have often said that if Mountain Dew Kickstart would happen to be watching any of these videos, that I typically drink one of them per day during my lectures. So um, I'd be happy to give them a shout out every now and then if they were to like maybe send me a few cases every once in a while. I even have a t-shirt. One of my students actually gave me a t-shirt of them. So, all right. So, if we look. Table goes around everything. TR goes around the first row. In the, in, in the first row, all the, number, all the values are headers, so we have THs. In each subsequent row, we have a TR tag and an NDR TR tag to go around the row. We have then four TDs, because that is table data. Likewise, we have TDs for this one and this one. So now if we were to look at it, it's going to make it look like that. All right, yay. We have a table. Now, it isn't a particularly attractive looking table. All right. Um, how big did it make the table? The browser made the table a certain size. How big did it make it? In other words, it, it covers up this amount, amount of the screen. It doesn't cover up the whole screen. Why did it make it this big? Right. It, it, it made it just big enough to cover the space of the content that's in there. So, for example, let's look at the first column. The first column, what's the biggest thing in the first column? It would probably be the word Los Angeles. So the first column is this big, all right, to allow the biggest thing to fit in there. So a table doesn't, by default, doesn't cut off any content. And it doesn't wrap it around to a new line either. All right? Um, if something else became the, the, the biggest uh, uh, column, then, it, then the, the table would be resized to make sure that it was the biggest thing. So in these, the biggest thing are these headers. So it makes it big enough to fit those headers in. It does give it a little bit of space between it, all right? So the defaults for padding or margin or something are set. Notice a couple other things. Notice that the headers look different. The headers are bold. The headers are also centered. And it's not obvious that they're centered when you look at like this. But if you remember that this column is this big, then March is centered within that. It's just that it takes up the whole thing. So yes, March is actually centered um, in that uh, column. So the table by default, this is the browser default. Let's review the browser default. Because remember that the way your page looks, or the way the things on your page look, always depend on two things. Depends on the defaults of the browser, and it depends on what your CSS tells, describes the formatting. So before we get into the CSS, I think it's important to look and say, hey, that's the browser default. All right. So the browser default is that it's going to be as big as it needs to be. All right. It's going to make each column as big as the biggest thing in that column. It's going to make each row um, big enough to fit the text or, or whatever's in the row. Um, the, the headings, by default, are going to be centered and um, in bold. If you want to change that 
you do it via CSS. For example, and, and here, here's a great example, and this goes along with the command I said before about don't lie to your browser. What if I wanted these headings to be not centered and not bold? I could do that two ways. One of the ways is correct, one of the ways is wrong. One of the ways I could do that is make them TDs instead of THs. All right. If I went and made that first row of TDs, then it would get the job done. It would make this be left aligned and not bold. It would make the headings. The other way I could do it is I could do it through CSS, which is the correct way. Changing these tags to TDs or using CSS. using CSS, right? Don't lie to your browser. These are headings. They should be in a TH tag. So you could trick your browser into treating them like TD tags, but that limits the flexibility of things that you can do later on. So if I did not want the THs to be centered and bold, I could create a style for it and create a style rule for THs. to say th font weight normal text align left. And there, it did it. Now, the advantage of that is if I later on say, you know what, I don't want them to, I still want them to be left aligned, and I still want them to be normal, but I want it to be bigger and a different color. Well, then I could say font size 1.2 am color blue. And I could do that. All right. If I made those TDs, I wouldn't be able to do that because if I made those TDs, if I changed the rule for TDs, then all the TDs would get it. And I'd have to go to a more complex involved CSS. I could do it, but it wouldn't be as straightforward. So the bottom line is your tag should represent what the code really represents. If it's a header, put it in a th, th tag. If you don't like the way the th tag looks, that's fine. But you can use CSS to correct that. Don't lie and make it a TD tag just to make it look like other TD tags. All right. That's the very basics of tables. So what are we going to talk about now? We're going to talk about um, three things at least. We're going to talk about styling tables. We're going to talk about accessibility with tables. And then we're going to talk about some other th cool things that you can do with tables um, beyond the simple, straightforward ones. Now, when I go over styling of the tables, um, it's important to remember that anything that I can do via CSS, I can do to tables via CSS. So we've done things like what? We've changed the font. We've changed the color. We've changed the size. We can do all those things with it. All right. It's also important to know to do this in, in sort of a purposeful way. All right. So let's eliminate this. First thing we're going to do is I'm going to make the table um, bigger. So there I saved it. I got rid of the style that was there before. Let's make the table bigger. Now, we could make the table bigger a couple different ways, right? We could make the table bigger by giving a size to the table. Or I could make the table bigger by giving sizes to the TDs or the THs, right? So um, 
We'll play around with this and we'll see what we come up with. So I could go TD with two hundred pixels. All right. What does that do? Well, let's go give each one of these TDs, this one, this one, this one, a width of two hundred pixels. So then the biggest thing in the table is not going to be the header, but it's going to be each TD for each column. And so we'll stretch it out like that. And the same thing would work if I did it with THs. The other thing I could do that would give me approximately the same result would be to set the width for the entire table. I could say table and give it a width of 800 pixels and it will give me approximately the same thing as I have before. Because before I had uh, four columns, each were 200 pixels, so that's about 800. If I say the table is 800, then it's going to give me um, a width of, of, total width of 800. But it's not identical, believe it or not. It's not going to be identical. Notice how it sort of switched around them a little bit. It's important to see the difference between that. All right? When I set each row, oh, I'm sorry, when I set each column to be a certain size, um, it set them all to be an even size. When I set each, when I set the entire table, it made the entire table that size, but it divided up that space proportionately. All right? In other words, because this was originally, this city was originally the biggest column, it gave city the biggest amount of space in the table. And January and February are about the same size. March is a little bigger because March is bigger than Feb and Jan. All right? So I give the total space. The browser divides up that total space proportionately. So the wider columns get more space out of what I've given. All right? Just to review that, let me take out this. There's with no style. Notice with no style, the biggest column is city because it has the word Los Angeles in it. Mar this column, March, is bigger than January and Feb because the word March is bigger than January and Feb. When I go and add back that style to say that the total table has a width of 800 pixels, the biggest column is still going to be city, the second biggest column is still going to be March, and Jan and Feb are going to be approximately the same. Now, I could give the browser conflicting instructions, all right? Why would I want to? Well, of course you wouldn't want to, but you could. I think it's important to show what the browser does um, if you give uh, instructions that are a little bit uh, conflicting. What I mean by conflicting, I could say that the each TD has a width of 300 pixels. All right. So because there's four TDs, that's going to make the total width of the table 1,200 pixels. Yet I've defined the width to be 800 pixels. What does the browser do? Well, the browser isn't going to cut anything off, so it's going to make each TD 300 pixels wide and even though I've said the pixels are 800 for the whole table, it's going to make the whole table 1,200 pixels wide. If I remember to save it. Actually, interesting, I lied. It didn't do that. And this just goes to show 
is best not to give conflicting information to the CSS because the browser is going to do what it figures is right. What did it do? It made the entire, entire table 800 pixels and it divided the TDs up evenly. So instead of dividing up proportionately because I put a width on each individual TD, it went and it divided them proportionately so each of them has have the same size. So if I don't have the TD in there, it's 800 and the, the, the columns are divided proportionately. If I do have the rule for TD in there to make them all the same width, it's going to keep it at 800 and it's going to divide the 800 um, evenly. Now you can also use percentages for either of these two things. And again, keep in mind that percentages is often uh, a very welcome thing to do with uh, um, elements to get sort of the responsive CSS. So I could, instead of saying a width of being 800 pixels, I could say the width is going to be 80%. And I'm going to eliminate the TDs for now. So if I make the width of 80%, what it's going to do is it's going to make the width of the whole table 80% of the screen. And it's going to, because I've not defined a size for the TDs, it's going to make those proportional. As I resize this, it's going to make it smaller and smaller. But it's still going to keep it proportional. until I can't make it any smaller. If I did something like this, TD, with 25%. What does that 25% relate to? The entire width of the screen or the width of the table? The width of the table. All right. Whenever you have tags within a tag and you give a percentage to the inner tag, the percentage is always a percentage of the available space. So the table takes up 80% of the screen the width of each of these TDs is going to take up 25%, but it's going to take 25% of the table's width, not 25% of the whole screen. So if we look at this, it might be easier to see if we put a color on the table. So let's go and let's make, uh, give the color a different uh, give the table a different color. Background. Background. All right. Now as I make it bigger or smaller, notice that as the table gets smaller, each column also gets smaller. Because it's defined as 25% of um, the 80% of the page. Now notice something it did here is it split Los Angeles into two, um, into two lines. It will do that if there's like a space between words. It will not ever do that for something like Minneapolis because there's no space there. So it will never divide Minneapolis any smaller than that. So notice it's making the other column smaller, but it's not making Minneapolis any smaller.
All right. Let's try to make this table look good. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout out things that I want to do the table. And if you have an answer on how I can do it, feel free to shout back. Feel free to shout back even if you don't have an answer. Just shout. This class is too, long, too quiet. All right, let's get some noise going on in here. All right. What if I wanted to center the table? All right, so right now this is our starting point. All right. Whereas the table takes up 80% of the screen, each column is 25% until I get certain width, and then it's going to make, it's not going to cut off Minneapolis at all. So what if I wanted to center this table? On, on what? On the, table. on the table tag. All right, so if I say margin, 0px, auto, that should do the trick. All right, cool. What if I wanted to put, create grid lines like we have in Excel? Like you notice in Excel there were, you could see the lines, horizontal and, and vertical. What if I wanted to do that? Pardon me? Border, all right. Border on what? Well, let's try putting the border on the table, all right. You can almost tell by just the way I said that. Let's try to put the border on the table that this isn't going to work, all right. Border. Um, 2px blue solid. And I should rephrase that. It's not that it's not going to work, but it might be surprising to see exactly how it does work. So if I put the border on the table tag, it literally puts a border around the table. And that might be what we want, but that wasn't what I described. All right, I described that we wanted the, the lines like in Excel. So how could we do that? Put it on the TD tag. Yeah, I copied the bracket. There we go. All right. So there we have that. All right. We're almost there. All right. We're missing a couple things. First of all, we don't have the THs included in there. Well, that should be easy enough to do. We could do this a couple of different ways. We could do this. just repeat the definition for THs. All right. But there's these sort of annoying little spaces between there. All right. How do we do that? How do we get rid of that? Well, this one I wouldn't expect you to know. But if you say border collapse, collapse. That removes that little gap between the borders. And it makes it like that. Okay. I'm going to go through a few examples again. You know, it's purely up to you the way you want your tables to look. It might depend on the page and it might depend on the kind of data, but I want you to be able to come up with um, any sort of, of 
of design for a table all right, that you might want. What, what if I wanted to do this? So in a way, this is more of a CSS puzzle than, than a table puzzle. What if I wanted to do this? What if I wanted my table to look like this? City. Cleveland. Los Angeles, Minneapolis. Well, I didn't want all the grid lines, but I just wanted a line underneath each row. Border bottom for what? That's correct. I could do it that way. So I could go in here and I could say TD border bottom and th. And there we go. All right. Can anyone think of another way to do it? I mean, it's a perfectly fine way. I, you know, I wouldn't say this is a right way or a wrong way. This is a good, as good a way as any. But there is another way to do it. I know. Well, tell us then, wise guy, what is the other way to do it? You could put a bottom border on the TR. And has the same effect, right? Because it puts a bottom border underneath the whole row, all right? What if, what if I didn't want that's, that's really good for the concentration when I'm trying to think of what I want to say. What if I want this? Remember, I mean, remember back to the probably something I said the first week of class that web design is a combination of technical and design skills. So what I'm doing now is sort of reviewing the technical aspect of CSS. Now, it'll be up to you to decide when you would want to do this or the other. But we're coming up with sort of things to try to, to make it um, um, to, 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 uh, um, to test the technical knowledge of CSS. And then we will, you know, it'll be up to you to decide when you want to apply it. But what if I wanted the tables to look like this? All right, like a grid, but no top. No top line on the top row. No bottom line on the bottom row. No left on the leftmost column. No right on the rightmost column. probably do this a whole bunch of ways. Boy, this makes me wish I had a final exam in this class because this would be a great final exam question. Well, let's play with it. Oh, go ahead. Ah, you're, you're getting warm. That, that's actually not a long way. You're going to have to do something like that. You're going to have to use classes or IDs, all right, because what I could do is this. I could go in and say, T 
TH, TDTH. When you put a comma between the selectors, that means both those selectors apply. And I could do border bottom one pixel black solid. And I could do border right one pixel black solid. And that's going to give me like 80 percent of what I want. All right. It doesn't do the top. It doesn't do the right, left side. The problem is it does the bottom on Minneapolis and it does the right on the last column. So, I'm going to have to write a style rule now to get rid of those two things. Get rid of the bottom style on the blast row, and I'm going to um, get rid of the, the, the um, um, right grid line on the last column. We have a choice to use IDs or classes. What do you think is better in this case, an ID or a class? Why do you say a class? Because more than one, I'm gonna, I want to do something to more than one thing. I want to, for example, get rid of the bottom border on these four things. I'm going to get rid of the right border on these four things. No, you cannot see it. We're making it harder. All right. You want, the, you want to get rid of the bottom border on these four things. You want to get rid of the right border on these four things. So I want to treat a group of things a certain way. So anytime you say a group of certain things a certain way, you're talking about a class. If I pick ID, I better be pretty sure, I better be real sure that there's only one thing on the page that I'm ever going to want to do that to. All right? So, what I can do is I could do something like this. Describe to me in words, or, or let, 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 let me describe to you in words what I want to do to this. All right? The last row in the table, I want all the TDs in the last row to have no border. All right? So, how can we write that using a combination? Uh, how can we write that in HTML, in CSS? How can we define, first of all, what the last row is? That we actually probably could use an ID for, but we could use a class as well. I could give this last row a class of something. This one I stand corrected. There only is one last row in a table by definition, so I could make this an ID as well. So, dot last row says I want to do something to the things that have a class of last row. All right, what do I want to do to the things that have a class of last row? I want to make sure that well, let's try this, because I don't think this is going to work, but it'll be interesting.
Yeah, let's try that. Uh, I don't think the fact that it made it border bottom none is what caused it not to work, though. Let's, let's try to view this from the perspective of the browser. I have two style rules that deal with the border. One for TD and one for the last row. So it puts no bottom border on this last row, but it does put a border on all of the TDs in the table. So even though I said there's no border on the last row, there's a conflicting rule that says there's borders for the TDs and all the TDs. So I could get around that by saying last row TD, border of none. All right. The reason for that is what this is saying, if you're going like, to just talk this out in English, all the TDs that are part of the last row get no border. And there we go. Now, how do we do, this? We do virtually the same thing? The only difference being is we have to define the class on the four items. So I could say last column. Last column TD have no border. And then on all of the last columns, Oh, border bottom line. Right, 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 right. Border right. Thanks. Oh. There's no... I'm not saying the things I have a class of T, uh, of last column, they have a TD in them. I just want to say that things have a uh, class of last column. And that gets rid of that. The one thing I urge you to do is there would be a brute force way of doing this. The brute force way of doing this would be to add a whole bunch of IDs to the last thing in, in each row and the last uh, row in there and just setting styles that way. Um, it's good if you can take some time to think about the, the, the CSS and write clean CSS that you could easily change if you needed to without having to get rid of a bunch of IDs or changing the rules for IDs and so on. All right. We certainly can give, what well, if we wanted to make, we'll do a little more simpler one. What if I wanted to make the top row of the table have light gray with white text, or gray, gray with white text? How could I do that? Here's my table. I want this row to be gray with white text. 
I could give it an ID. I could give it a class. Or I could notice that the reason that I want to make that a different color, you know, what's the reason just in English that I want to make it a different color? Because they're headings. And therefore I could say on THs, really what I want is I want THs to have a background of, let's make some shade of gray, 777777, and a color of white. Um, I find that if you can describe in words why you want to change something, that's a good way to sort of figure out the best way to do that. All right. The other ways that you suggested would have worked, but probably the preferred way would be to say, I want to change that row, not just because it's the first row, but because it's the row that contains the headers. So therefore, I want to change that. And sure enough, there we go. Um, let's see. One thing that's done a lot of times, um, and this is a, this is a carryover to uh, even the old days when you had computer uh, printout paper. I don't know if any of you ever saw those old computer printouts that were like, they called green bar paper, where there'd be alternating bars of white and green bars. And the reason for that is if you're reading across, like these were usually wide sheets of paper, if you're reading across a wide sheet of paper, your eye, and if you're reading numbers in a, like a, a printout across a wide sheet of paper, your eye has a tendency to maybe go up or down. And you might get the wrong, you might see the wrong number as being in the wrong row. So to sort of help your eye to line it up, they would alternate colored bands. So you could see, oh, that's green going all the way across, that's white going all the way across, and so on. You can do a similar thing with um, CSS. So let's go and just for, to make this a little more realistic, let's duplicate these. Let's duplicate these rows a couple times. I just want to add more data. just want to add more data to the table. So I'm just going to duplicate these rows. All right. So even on a screen, if you're reading 80 degrees, you can see March. If you go across, especially if there was a bunch of columns in this table, your eye is liable to go up or down, and you're liable to misread that. It's easier to get um, out of line. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about how we could make it so that the alternating rows were different colors. Now, one straightforward way we could do it is we could assign a class to the even rows and a class to the odd rows, and then assign colors based on the class. But there's a cool little trick in CSS3 that you can use. I'm looking it up on a W3.org site. And I'm doing this just for um, just to, to, to show you that this is actually the official rules. Um, other sites on the web can give examples and can, can be useful, but 
The definitive rules are defined on the W3C org site. So this says, for example, that you could do this. Let's pop that in there. TR, nth child even, nth child odd. And then you can set the backgrounds for those. So with just a couple lines of code, you can make the table lines alternate. If I was going to polish this off to make it look good, what I probably would do would be to I'd probably align the numbers so that they appear underneath and make it look like that. So that's kind of my final version of the table. And again, notice everything about the appearance you can do via CSS. There are some things you can put in HTML, uh, but you're going to avoid doing that. All right? I've, I've seen some people put, for example, the border attribute on the table tag. Use CSS to accomplish uh, borders if you want them. All right, um, up next. Accessibility. All right. I mentioned that people that can see can immediately tell what a piece of data is by looking up and looking across and finding the row and the table, or the row and the column header. So if I ask what this number represents, you'd look up and say that's February from Minneapolis. But remember how people access the screen reader uh, or, or access the web that are visually impaired. They have a screen reader narrate it to them. And by narrating it, it's going to read going across. It's going to what, what they call linearize the table. So when you're reading it, it might not be obvious it's just going to read the numbers in order, Minneapolis 5, 15, 20, and you would have to say, well, what did that 15 represent? All right. So what you can do is you can put a scope attribute uh, on the um, THs and, and sort of the row headers. Let's Google that. So we can say that this TD is a scope of a column, which means that it is the header for this entire column. They did say that there's no longer scopes allowed on TDs. So if I wanted these to be considered table headers for the rows, I would have to make these THs.
I'm going to get rid of the duplicated rows in here. Now, when we do this, we're not going to be able to notice any difference in how it looks. But assistive technology would be able to better identify what the column row and headings are. How? Pardon me? I got that column rows. Column and rows, right. I had to make those THs because you can't have a scope on a TH. There are more involved things that you can do as far as accessibility, like putting IDs in. But generally speaking, for simple tables, the scope attribute is enough. You want to keep your tables simple. What do I mean by that? It means that tables should contain one kind of data. So let's say, for example, I had the temperatures of March or January through March. And I wanted to do then below it the, the, te the temperatures for April, uh, May, and June. All right? I could make it part of this table simply by copying all this. And changing this to. April, May, and June. Where I had one table that combined, the top part of the table is January, February, and March. The bottom half is April, May, and June. That's generally not a good idea. All right? That poses a lot of difficulty for screen readers because if you got down to this number, there are two things that say that there are column headers for this, the May and the June. The better way to do this would be to break this up into two tables and have a separate table for, um, for January through February, January, February, March, and a separate table for April through June or April through May. So the better way to do this would be with separate tables. So don't take two tables and sort of say, well, I can sort of combine them into one table. Each table should have its own distinct meeting. Notice that looks virtually the same. All right. Um, but conceptually, it's two tables, and a screen reader will handle it better. If we wanted to put a little bit of space between the two, we could put uh, a margin on the top as well. And that would put some space in between them. Can I put things other than text in a table? Absolutely. I could put images in a table. All right. I could put links. I could put any HTML in a table. Uh, but it would be, again, either in a table row or, or, I'm sorry, a table header or table data. Couple other things in tables. There are associated with tables a caption. The caption has to be the line right after 
the table tag. So I could do something like this. Average temp for three cities. January through March. And for my second table, I'd also give it a caption. By default, it puts it there, the table centered underneath it. And of course, we could, we could change that via CSS any way we wanted to. We could go in and say, table caption. size 1.2 M font color red text align right Let's, let's not give it red. We're, we're not having a colorful table. That puts that over there. Actually, it should be color, not font color. There we go. The point through all of this is that visually we can get the table to look just about any way we want it to by applying the proper CSS to it. You start out with the basic layout for the table and then you can expand it however you want to. Um, one last thing for tables, you can have I'll show you in this example. I won't do it to this. You actually can designate sections of the table by saying T head, T foot, and T body. So for example, if you had a, a last, in, in the, the reason I didn't do it in my example is because it really didn't make sense, but if the last row of your table, for example, is the sum of something, like you're doing a budget, and you're saying that you know, your income is coming from this, from this, from this, from this, and the last line of the table was the sum of those, well, you could call that last table uh, row as being in a T foot section. And that would put it at the bottom of the table, and then you could style it differently to designate that it was the, the, the ending part of the table. Likewise, you can do the same thing with the T head and the T body. Um, this is most useful, again, when you have special rows that um, represent like the, the sum or the average or something like that in a table. 
you can designate that these aren't regular ta ta uh, uh, table data cells, that these are like averages or whatever. Questions about any of this? A preview of JavaScript, which we'll spend maybe five minutes talking on before I end class today. But we will review this also again on Thursday. JavaScript allows you to easily add simple interactivity to the page without going back to the server. The reason that that is a win is because going back to the server takes a long time, at least in computer terms. All right. Even on a fast internet connection, the amount of time it takes to go and make a request to a web server, let the web server process it and send a response back, is a long time compared to how quickly instructions can execute on your computer. So JavaScript are instructions that are sent to your computer along with the HTML and CSS that allow for some interactivity. A great example of that, if you go to ESPN.com, is this. That's some interactivity. What do I mean by interactivity? I mean that I do something and the page responds by doing something. So for example, I pick WNBA. I pick top events. I hit this arrow. I do something, the page responds by doing something. And it responds in a specific way. It doesn't respond by asking the web server to do something and sending back a complete page. It responds by simply making a small change to the page that's already there. So I click on this, it scrolls over to show this information. I click this, it scrolls over to show that information. It does it without reloading the page. If you notice, the rest of the page stays stationary. Another example would be if I went to Amazon. Notice that as I put my mouse over these items, if I put it over accounts and lists, it shows me a list of things that I can go to. It didn't reload the whole page. That page is still there that I initially got. Right. But it made a change to the page. It showed something that was no longer, that wasn't there immediately when the page loaded. And if I move my mouse off of it, um, it disappears. So this is a classic example of JavaScript where we make a change to the page based on the user's action and we make a change to the page um, I think my glasses are going to crack in a second here. Oh, that's not good. No, that isn't. I totally lost my train of thought. Oh, it changes a page without reloading the entire page. All right, so, so I got it. when I click that, when I put my mouse over this, this appears, but that page is still there. So it's not, it's different than, say, clicking a link where you get a whole new page. You put your mouse over it and the page, the current page changes, all right? without reloading the entire page. And that's what we're going to look at next time. We're going to look at several examples of this, and we're going to learn how to do some simple things um, that, that are pretty common um, in, uh, in, uh, in web pages. 
that allow you to make your pages a little more interactive and, um, and so on. All right, so are there any questions? Keep working on your project. Um, and let me know if you have questions on other things. All right, we'll see you in lab.